Finally, expert paper four was about case definitions. And um, this paper was particularly important because it came to the conclusion that really we needed to use something very ob objective for measuring uh, gingival inflammation and gingivitis. And the only really objective measure we have, and in itself it has limitations, is that of bleeding on probing. So we went with bleeding on probing as our measure of um, gingival inflammation in terms of the extent uh, of inflammation and we decided that it wasn't really possible to measure severity of inflammation uh, because that requires an, an assessment of swelling and colour change and that is incredibly variable from one assessor to the next. Um, and then we went with the what we call the 30% and the 10% rule for defining the extent. So if 10% um, or more sites were bleeding, then we said that patient had localised uh, gingivitis. If, however, 30% um, or more of sites were bleeding, then we said that patient would have a generalised gingivitis. And less than 10% of sites bleeding in an intact periodontium where there's no attachment loss, uh, there's no bone loss at all, um, that was regarded as being compatible with clinical gingival health. So as you can see here, we have some very delayed bleeding following light probing. It's not a full uh, line of bleeding at the gingival margin. Uh, the patient otherwise is healthy. They don't have attachment loss or bone loss. So we regarded this as being a site of gingival inflammation, but in a case that was otherwise clinically healthy. Probing is a particular challenge, which is why I said that gingivitis uh, measured through bleeding on probing isn't e in fact as easy as you may think, because people probe with different pressures, and normally people probe too heavily. Uh, we classically say that you should probe at 0.25 newtons or 25 grams of weight around teeth, and even lighter pressures around implants, 0.2 newtons or, or 20 grams maximum. Um, but the problem is we don't have an ISO standard constant force probe. And this is something that we as a group felt needed to be developed uh, so that at least uh, when different practitioners around the world are using a periodontal probe, they're at least applying the same pressure to that probe when trying to uh, distinguish health from gingivitis from periodontitis. So that was a recommendation that came from the group. So um, just to bring things towards a close now, we felt it was important to make the point in our group that actually classification is not diagnosis. They're two completely different things. But it's important to have a classification to inform the diagnosis. And this diagram here explains what I mean by the difference between classification and diagnosis. So um, we can classify a patient as being periodontally healthy if they have an impact tac periodontium. Uh, and less than 10% of sites that bleed. If plaque accumulates, as we've discussed, that patient may develop gingivitis. And gingivitis is reversible. If we remove the plaque or interrupt the plaque uh, and reduce plaque levels, then we can return to health because there's been no connective tissue attachment loss. That apical cell of the junctional epithelium has remained attached to the, the enamel just uh, above the cemento enamel junction. And then in risk patients, that gingival inflammation may progress to periodontitis, and therefore the patient becomes a periodontitis patient. And there was a general agreement here that in the case of periodontitis, the arrow only goes in one direction. Once the bony attachment have been lost, they cannot generally be uh, replaced. Uh, and therefore that periodontitis patient becomes classified as a periodontitis patient for life. Doesn't mean they can't have a healthy clinical situation, but they are a periodontitis patient for life because their risk is much, much higher than someone who has never had periodontitis in the past. So the basic classification is very simple. It's health, it's gingivitis, or it's periodontitis as a case or as a patient. When we then translate that into the diagnosis itself, then in the case of health, that's fairly straightforward. The classification pretty much matches the diagnosis. So a case of health would be given a diagnosis of periodontal health. Similarly, in the case of a patient who is a case of gingivitis, then the diagnosis would be the same. It would be gingivitis. Things are different, however, with a periodontitis patient because, of course, the periodontitis patient 
uh, who's classified as a case of periodontitis will undergo therapy. And at the end of that therapy, they may enter into a different clinical situation. So ideally, or optimally, the periodontitis patient will stabilize. And we define stability here as less than 10% of sites that are bleeding on probing from the base of the pocket. Probing pocket depths that are either equal to or less than four millimeters, but there must be no bleeding at a four millimeter site, otherwise that would be a periodontitis site. And so here we have a periodontitis patient who is actually periodontally stable, so they are a case of stability. Equally, that periodontal treatment may work, um, but we may find that the patient has a little bit too much inflammation for them to be regarded as being entirely stable. And in that situation, we would use the term remission. So here we have a periodontitis patient who is in remission. If they have more than 10% of sites equal to or more that are bleeding, they have some generalized gingival inflammation. However, the probing pocket depths must still be four millimeters or less. And again, there can be no bleeding at a four millimeter site, or that would be a periodontitis site. So here we have a periodontitis patient who is in remission. And then finally, the scenario that we try to avoid, and that is uh, an unstable uh, periodontitis patient. And this would be a patient who essentially had uh, probing pocket depths that were five millimeters or more, or had four millimeter pockets that did actually bleed. That would be a patient who was, who was regarded as being either unsuccessfully treated at those sites or maybe has lapsed into the disease reactivating because of their risk of periodontitis. Now it's important for periodontitis patients to know that they can be stable uh, and, and healthy if you like again. And I use this as a classic example of why. This patient you'll see has uh, fairly advanced bone loss involving root resorption of lower incisors. Uh, this patient was a neurosurgeon, a very busy uh, professional um, who struggled to commit to uh, attending dental appointments. But once the consequences of the disease process were explained to him, and once he was given behavior change advice, then he could be treated non-surgically. And the outcome of that treatment when we treated him non-surgically was quite interesting. This is him in March 2007. You can see the amount of bone destruction. This is him uh, three months after the initial phase of non-surgical treatment. You can see we had to section the upper left lateral incisor uh, and in fact simply use a composite uh, uh, material to cement the crown in place as a temporary bridge. But otherwise, he retained his remaining teeth and we're starting to see some bone regeneration just from the non-surgical periodontal treatment. Um, the upper left central incisor needs root filling, so that was done because it had a periapical periodontitis. And his level of motivation and his level of plaque control was such that 10 years later, uh, he still has retained all of his teeth. He has no bleeding on probing in his mouth at all, and he has no pockets that are greater than four millimeters. So he has a mouth full of closed pockets. You'll see we've even managed to do orthodontic treatment to close the spaces in the anterior teeth, and you see the wire fixed retainer in place. So for this patient uh, who deals with patients himself with terminal brain cancer uh, throughout his entire life, so he deals with their families as well, it was important to him that whilst he was a periodontitis patient, he knew that he could be stabilized and he could remain stable potentially for the rest of his life. A similar situation, therefore, uh, in the next patient. She was a patient who presented with spaces between her teeth. She was suffering from uh, what looks to me at a glance here as a stage three, probably a stage four, actually, because of the spacing and the need for orthodontic treatment, stage four periodontitis. She was relatively young. Uh, and so the bone loss was in uh, excess of her age. So she's a stage four grade C periodontitis patient, um, but she wants treatment. That treatment in her case was successful. Um, at the time that we finished the non-surgical phase, she had no bleeding. She had five four millimeter probing pocket depth sites in her mouth, all the rest were three millimeters, but those four millimeter sites didn't bleed on probing. So we undertook the orthodontic treatment uh, the spaces were closed and she was put into fixed retention. And at the end of that treatment, again, she had no bleeding on probing in her mouth. Uh, 
she still had five four millimeter probing pocket depth sights. They were different sights actually to uh, before we started the orthodontic treatment and all the other sites were three millimeters, but there was no bleeding at the four millimeter sites. So she is a periodontitis patient, but she is clinically healthy or stable is a better word to use than health um, because she obviously has a reduced periodontium. And the low lip line meant that the recession was not a particular aesthetic problem for her. She was happy with that outcome. So the four millimeter site, the closed pocket as we call it, the non-bleeding four millimeter site is our end point, if you like, for successful periodontal treatment. Uh, if we get sites of four millimeters or below that are not bleeding, then we can uh, refer to the patient as being stable. So really my last slide here sums up all of those definitions for you on an intact and a reduced periodontium. So um, an intact periodontium, a case of health on an intact periodontium would have no probing attachment loss, uh, would have no radiological bone loss. The probing pocket depths would be three millimeters or less and bleeding throughout the mouth would account for less than 10% of sites. That would be clinical health. Gingivitis is pretty much the same, but we do have bleeding at 10% or more of sites. And if it's less than 30%, if it's 10 to 30%, that's localized gingivitis. And if it's more than 30%, that's generalized gingivitis. A fairly straightforward uh, case definition. Then uh, we have the patient with the reduced periodontium, but that reduced periodontium has been due to uh, reasons other than having periodontitis. It may be due to crown lengthening surgery or due to a wisdom tooth removal, giving rise to bone loss on the distal aspect of a second permanent molar. And in fact, the definitions there are identical to those for an intact periodontium. The only difference is that radiologically, then it's possible that there will be some bone loss because we've got a reduced periodontium, but it wasn't induced by the periodontitis itself. And then the final category is perhaps the most challenging one, and it challenged us as a, as a, a workshop uh, a great deal, and that is how do we define health on a reduced periodontium in a periodontitis patient, because it's a periodontitis patient for life. And so we define that as, um, yes, we've got attachment loss. We have probing pocket depths that are four millimeters or below, but there are no bleeding four millimeter sites. Um, the bleeding on probing is at less than 10% of sites throughout the entire mouth. And yes, we have radi radiological bone loss. But remember, this is a periodontitis patient for life. So perhaps using the term health is with hindsight, not the best term to use. So we would use the term stability now, as I showed you in the flow diagram. And then gingival inflammation is the default of that, if you like. Uh, we didn't use the term gingivitis because it's not possible to have a periodontitis case who's also coincidentally a gingivitis case. So it might sound like semantics, but it was an important discussion point. Um, a periodontitis patient is a patient with periodontitis for life, but that can be treated. They may end up with gingival inflammation. Um, and that gingival inflammation uh, will be associated with probing attachment loss, but the probing pocket depths will be three millimeters or below. Okay, so we don't have bleeding at a four millimeter site, we have three millimeters or below, and then we do have bleeding at 10% or more than sites in the mouth. So we have gingival inflammation, but at this moment in time, it's gingival inflammation. It's a patient who is probably in remission and they don't have sites of active periodontitis defined by four millimeter probing depths that bleed or five millimeter sites or greater. So that's it. Um, I hope that has um, been clear. Um, it was really quite controversial even to get to this point. It sounds relatively simple and hindsight is always simple. But that is, if you like, an overview of how we define health and gingival diseases and conditions, uh, both in an intact and a reduced periodontium. Uh, and that summarizes the findings really of group one uh, of the World Workshop in Periodontitis and the conclusions we came to in Chicago on a very cold November uh, two and a half days. I hope you found that useful.